Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome once again to our reinvention laboratory. This is already our third day, and we've had two very interesting days here in this arena with very vivid discussions. And yes, I'm hoping for another day like that today and uh, have the pleasure to welcome you here to uh, our next session. Uh, most of you have probably seen me already. I am Corinna Egra. I have the great pleasure to be your host during this entire week here in the Reinvention Laboratory. Facilitating innovation through standardization. That's our topic today. The session deals with the question how standardization supports innovation from three perspectives. Standardization helps communication across disciplines, facilitates new product development, and it's important to instill confidence in innovative products on the market. We have three spe speeches during this session, and we'll each have them followed by Q&A, so a discussion with you, and uh, yes, we hope to have, indeed, another, another interesting uh, dialogue here in this arena. If you're wondering about this white thing and that item there, I'm not going to talk about that now, you'll find out during this session. So, let's get started. Our first speaker is already here. It is Martin Poppe. He is professor. Hello, Martin. Hello. <laughs> nice to have you here. He's professor at the University of Applied Sciences in Münster, Germany, where he teaches electronics, prototyping, and electrodynamics. His title is Updating Electrodynamics, New Terms for New Cooperations. Yeah. Very excited to hear your speech. Martin, welcome. Thanks a lot. Yeah, and uh, welcome to you as well. Oh, hang on. I heard that this session is supposed to be a little bit interactive, so I have a little quiz for you. We have four statements there which you may know from your lectures while you were still a student. Uh, and there's one thing all these statements have in common. So what is common to these statements? That's the quiz. And if you're brave enough to s stay through the entire talk, I shall give you the answer in the end. Apart from that, I would like to invite you to a change of perspective. You know, my personal uh, view of things is maybe different from most electrical engineers because I worked in basic research before I came into electrical engineering. And uh, I would like to invite you to come with me and look at electrodynamics from a different point of view than you had so far. Uh, that means I'll give you some ideas about what relativity might teach us on electrodynamics. I will then proceed to derive the equations of uh, electromagnetic fields in matter from Maxwell's equation, and then see what reinterpretation of D and H that gives. And of course, this has implications to the terminology and also, of course, to the way of thinking we have. So let's get started with that and start with good old Einstein. You own all the theory of relativity that uh, you see a little bit of the beginning of the text. And even if you don't know German, you will recognize that it is about electrodynamics, as it says in the title. And right at the beginning, Einstein refers to Maxwell. So it really is electrodynamic paper. And you all know some of the consequences. You've heard of the equivalence of mass and energy, and you've also heard of all these funny uh, things that happen close to the speed of light. What is probably less familiar is the fact that Einstein said something about the forces in electrodynamics. And he concluded that you cannot treat the Coulomb force and the Lorentz force separately. He said you always have to take the sum of both, and he thought it was so important that he gave it an extra name. He said, I call it the electrodynamic force. And uh, what it means is the following. Assume I have some charges on my fingertips, and you all know I have an electric field in my hand. Yeah? So, but for somebody passing by at a high velocity, Einstein concluded, he will not see just an electric field, but a mixture of an electric and a magnetic field. So he concluded that electric fields and magnetic fields are two aspects of the same thing. And thus, he also helped 
uh, to have the insight that really the one and only partner of the E field is the B field and nothing but the B field. That's the first thing. And the other thing is also you can uh, describe the whole of electromagnetism by this, this one force. There's no other forces apart from this one. And uh, so it will be also very hard to detect any other fields apart from the B field and the E field. Yeah? And that gives us uh, the link to the next paper of Einstein, that was 10 years later. He formulated general relativity. Now that is very complicated and it is not about electrical engineering. It's also not about electrodynamics. But it states a very important principle. And the principle is, if you cannot distinguish two things in theory, uh, no, and sorry, if you cannot distinguish two things by experiment, you shouldn't distinguish them in theory. He applied this idea to heavy mass and inert mass. Yeah? But we should also see whether we couldn't apply this principle to the fields we have in electromagnetism. Now, you just saw that there are no other fields that can be directly measured apart from E and B. So, according to Einstein, it would not be a good idea to impose another field apart from B, for example, an H field. Yeah? And uh, one would also conclude that we shouldn't have a D field in addition to the E field, because there's just no way to measure them directly. So, the task is to formulate electromagnetism in a way that uses those two fields only. Yeah. So I shall do that uh, starting from Maxwell's equation, yeah, written down in terms of these two fields only. Uh, if you just look on the left side, on the, the green part is one example of them, written down in terms of E and B only. Yeah, you can write them this way. And you notice they are all linear, so the uh, principle of superposition holds. That means, for example, if you have two wires, one with one current, uh, for example, E green, and then another one with another current, you can either first add the currents and then calculate the fields, or you can first calculate the fields from the individual currents and then add the fields. You see, it doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want. And as long as they are well distinct, like one wire here and one wire there, Maxwell's equation will hold for each of the sets individually. Yeah. And that's an important point, because we can apply the same idea for fields in matter. Suppose you have some molecule which, at the beginning, seems to have no charges because it's all nice, neutral and equally distributed. As soon as you apply an external electric field, yeah, you will have some separation of charges within that molecule. And what will result there is simply one field, which is merely the vector sum of the two. Yeah? The uh, field from the free charges and the field from the polarization. So now we can play the same game as before uh, and say, well, we'll use this addition and we'll use the fact that Maxwell's equation, in this case Gauss' law for the electric field, applies for each set individually. And we simply insert for the electrical field from the free charges the difference between the field you measure, E, and the field of polarization. And what you get is this uh, equation right at the bottom. This might look familiar to you, just you know it in a completely different form. You know it like this. Yeah? You've all heard that in the lectures. But if you compare the two, it's quite interesting. I mean, Three lines from the bottom, there's something which should be true, and the bottom shows something which you know to be true, and they only differ in the last bit, and so the last two bits must be identical. Yeah? So we can identify what's called the polarization as simply that part of the electric field yeah, which is made by the polarization of the uh, atoms. And we also conclude that is what was called D is nothing else than the field from the free charges. Yeah. So, and of course you can play the same game on the magnetic field. Yeah. And uh, again you can compare and you end up with the following mapping. 
what is known as the H field is the contribution of the magnetic field from free currents. What is known as magnetization is the B field from bound currents. Uh, what is known as the electrical displacement is the electrical field uh, from free charges. And what is known as polarization is the electrical field from bound charges. Just that's not so obvious because due to old conventions, it's multiplied by some constants and sometimes even with a minus sign. So what's really going on is really hidden by notation. It's much simpler than you think. It is not six different fields. It's just two with various contributions from different sources. Using this, we can write down the equations in matter. The first four I've shown to you are the ones you all know. Yeah? Just in this notation where I've replaced the Ds and the Hs. And then there's two more equations which relate to the bound charges and bound currents, which you probably don't know. Now, the significance of those two extra equations is just to uh, find consistency with Maxwell. Because if you add the two equations relating to the uh, currents, you will find Maxwell's equation without any separation between bound and free currents. And if you add the two equations with the charge densities, you will find Maxwell's equations for uh, the case where you don't separate. So then we have six equations for two fields instead of four equations for four fields. And actually, if you could separate further, for each new set of charges and currents, you would get two extra equations. So if you separated the bound charges into nuclei and electrons, uh, then you would have eight equations for two fields, and so on. The more you separate, the more equations you get. But if you add them all up, you always end up with the four Maxwell equations. So that uh, leads us to the last point, which is the most tricky one, and therefore... Oh, no. Last but one point, sorry. It is... Uh, there's a possibility to simplify things drastically by reinterpreting this difference that appears in Maxwell's equations, not as making a difference, but by a mapping. You can uh, reinterpret the subtraction of EP from E as a modification of E itself. And this is how the relative epsilon comes into the game. Yeah? And you can replace that everywhere and don't change anything in the physics, don't change anything in the dynamics. So if you have an old book, which is full of H's and D's and M's and P's, yeah, you can go through that book and wherever you have uh, a D, you just replace it by epsilon, epsilon R times E. And you do the same with the H, and then you have an entire book with the same contents, but without these two fields. Yeah? And that might be surprising to all those who think that those fields are fundamental. How can something be fundamental if it can be cancelled out of the theory completely? Yeah. So, but now finally the last point, and that's the most tricky one. And so I'll start right at the beginning. Yeah. 3,000 years ago, you all know from the Bible that man and woman shouldn't be separated. It was actually phrased in a different form. It is no good that man is on his own. Uh, but that was written down somehow, and by now we know why. Men and women should interact, and if they don't, mankind will die out. So the uh, meaning of that is obvious. There's another meaning to it, though, which is easily forgotten. And that is a theoretical one. We can only understand the behavior of men if we know that there are women around, and we can only understand the behavior of, of women if we know there are men around. So we can't treat them separately without knowing about the other. Now, that's obvious to us, and it was also obvious to Moses, but Moses was not very good at field theory, so he forgot about the second commandment, and that was, you should not separate interacting fields. And that is equally important just 3,000 years ago. It was not understood. So I give you an example why that obscures things. And the example is far away from electromagnetism. 
It's about tides. You all know that there are two tides per day. Yeah? And now we shall try to explain this phenomenon by taking one gravitational component by, at the time. Assume we just look at the gravitational field of the Earth. And then we have the ocean around it. And will we have tides? No, there will be no tides. Then we think, OK, there's the moon as well. So we let the moon rotate around the Earth. And where there's the moon, it will attract the sea. So we will have one tide per day. But you all know that, in fact, there are two tides per day. Why? Because moon and Earth are revolving around each other, and the revolving is slightly off-center from the center of the Earth. And that gives the second tide on the other side. The important point here is, if you look at one field at a time, you obscure things. You get either no tide or just one, but everybody knows it's two tides. And you can play the same game also on the gravitational field. Yeah. Assume you didn't know about this interplay between sun, uh, Moon and Earth. And you would just try to determine the Moon field by taking the entire gravitational field and subtracting the Earth field. Because the Moon is revolving ar uh, around the Earth, you would get suddenly a rotational component in the Moon field. And if you're an astronomer who's keen to be famous, you would come up and write a paper in contrast to the gravitational field, the moon field has a rotational component. Clearly, that's rubbish. Yeah? But if you just treat those two fields separately, which interact via the masses, then you make this mistake. Now, that seems obvious, but electrical engineers do the same thing. While they're saying, in contrast to the B field, the H field has sources. You make exactly the same mistake. What happens is you have free currents yeah, contributing to the magnetic field. You have bound currents contributing to the magnetic fields. And because matter is full of charges, they will interact. They will not just superimpose. They will interact. And if you try to blame the result of the interaction onto one of the fields only, you're making a fundamental mistake. Yeah? It's the same thing as if you were to blame the tides on the moon only and not onto the Earth-Moon system. So be careful with statements like that. So those are my conclusions. Yeah. Uh, we've seen that we need a paradigm shift, really. If we want to take serious what was found out uh, in the first half of last century, mainly by Einstein and his followers, is that Q, E, and B should be in the center of everything we define in electrodynamics. Yeah? My suggestion would be to call B the field of the magnetic force, because I think my terms should express the fact that they are so close relatives. Yeah? As they are two aspects of the same thing, they have to, should have similar names. And uh, the other quantities which appear in Maxwell's equation, I don't think one should call them fields. Yeah? They are really contributions, and they can't be treated on by themselves. Yeah? And uh, so they shouldn't be separated from E and B. As far as the systematic is concerned, I would wish that would, uh, we would have a stricter separation between measurable and non-measurable quantities. We should have a stricter separation between general cases and special cases, and also a stricter separation between laws and analogies. So this is the end of my talk, and you're welcome to ask questions. Martin, yeah. thank you very much. I've learned a lot. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it was indeed very fundamental science that yes. you presented. So yeah. let me ask this one question. Where, uh, the uh, where, where do you see the practical applications that would uh, benefit from your approach? As the whole thing is based, uh, what we classically do, is, is based on the separation between bound charges and free charges. When this separation is lo no longer possible, the system breaks together. And that is, the tr uh, that is the case when we enter nanotechnologies. Mm -hmm. One nanometer is about the size of an electron's orbit. Yeah? And if we consider sizes below that, then the distinction between free and bound is no longer valid. 
So the system we use today is not applicable to na nanosciences. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the other practical application is the uh, cooperation between scientists from different areas or engineers from different areas. When they use the same terms, they should mean the same things. Mm -hmm. Physicists, mechanical engineers, everybody else, chemists, thinks that uh, um, a flux density is a product of a density and a flux velocity. Electrical engineers don't. Yeah? So they might think of a better term for that. They all agree that the force is something which accelerates the mass. The electromotive force doesn't. So I think we are well advised to rethink our terminology such that everybody else understands this as well. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, is there a question uh, that you might have to Martin? If not, I think everybody is still busy thinking. So, um, well, thank you for giving us food for thought. And, <laughs> thanks uh, a lot. Thanks for yep. coming, Martin. Yeah, what a pleasure. Thanks. Martin Poppe, Professor Martin Poppe, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is uh, right here with me. It's Jean-Pierre Bresse. Uh, he is Open Innovation Director of uh, Sur Surgical Workflows Activity of the Gittinge Group in France. Hello, Pierre. Jean-Pierre, very nice to have you nice here. Welcome you. on stage. Uh, we will now witness a speech on how the work done in standardization committees can be used as a guidance for product development and contribute to innovation. Is that right? Yes, that's the that's topic of the Then day. the stage is yours. <laughs> Jean-Pierre Bresse. Thank you. So well, um, when I was invited, thank you, by the way, uh, to talk about um, standardization, innovation, and, uh, and the interaction between the two um, uh, topics, uh, I thought that would be good to, um, to use one of the uh, products that uh, is uh, uh, using these uh, standards and uh, that has to go with innovation. And then I decided to bring this uh, light, which is, uh, by the way, I, I could not bring a surgical light as such as the one you can see in uh, Dr. House or Emergency when you watch on TV and you will see this, uh, these sort of products. So I, I decided to bring something smaller. That's an examination light, but that will help me to illustrate what I'm talking about when I, when I talk uh, standardization and um, innovation. So, uh, the um, uh, three uh, key objectives of uh, following, of, uh, following uh, standardization committees, and there is one standardization committee which is related to this product. Um, we also make surgical tables. There is one IEC committee for surgical tables. I mean, we try to follow the different committees related to our uh, products. This um, committee related to uh, surgical lights is uh, uh, international. There are many uh, countries, many companies participating to this uh, committee. And this, is probably, and this is why it's probably so rich and interesting to follow and, uh, uh, and, to, uh, uh, and to attend. So I'll, I'll use uh, four uh, slides to uh, uh, support my speech and uh, the uh, four key objectives of attending uh, committees and uh, trying to make and find the link between standardization uh, topics and uh, uh, innovation. Are, uh, the first one is the guidance for product developments. It, it helps really in, prod in developing uh, products when attending uh, these uh, standards. You can also have a good surveillance of the uh, of the. Uh you can have a good surveillance of the regulatory changes and you should have a, an eye on what is changing on, on the standards when you are developing such a product because the technology is changing so uh, quickly. The third one is that uh, as a leader, when you want to be a leader in a, in a specific uh, topic, you need to be present to such important committees. And the fourth one is to support uh, business uh, and long-term relationships. So, uh, I, I will use this, this slide to illustrate uh, my, my topic, because surgical light is is, is light, of course, but light it can be this as well. I mean, it can be a, a, 
any, any sort of luminaire, hand, uh, light, and, and so on. This is, this is light, and it's a very subjective topic, you know. You, you think you, you see light, but you only see light when it hits a surface. It's very subjective. You talk about light, and you can make many, many speeches about light, but you need to you need to describe it with numbers, you need to describe it with uh, methods, and if you want to measure something, there is nothing best than a standard to give values and methods uh, to measure the standards. Let's talk about the illumination. The illumination is obviously the first topic that you want to promote, that you want to talk about when you, when, when, you, when you talk about the surgical light. The surgeons, when they operate, they need to have good enough light in, in, in the body of, of the patient. They need to have sufficient light, but not too high. Can you imagine that the surgical light, a, a good surgical light should be like between 100 thousand lux and 160,000 lux. 100,000 lux is the illumination given by the sun on the uh, French Riviera, let's say. It's very high in terms of illumination. 160,000 lux, it's almost twice the light coming from the sun. So it is necessary uh, to understand that this sort of safety, this sort of um, performance can be related to safety. And the standard is here to uh, give a, a limit to these uh, values. So, before this uh, standard, the IEC 6601-2-41 was uh, in place, there was no limit to the illumination, and the surgeons would use a surgical light with uh, 170, 200,000 lux, twice the light coming from the sun. Can you imagine that? That was too bright, that was too much light, and they could get glare when operating. Therefore, this group of um, experts could give a value, and now it's reduced. And we try to promote the idea that quality of the light, the way the light is distributed into the surgical field, is much better than the quantity of the light. It's not very easy to promote, because uh, I don't know you in, in your country, but in France at least, we learn very little from school in optics. I mean, it's very limited. So, uh, uh, talking about lux, lumens, uh, illuminance, and so on, I I with, a, with a surgeon who is uh, very educated, uh, though, in, in, a, in a five minutes uh, time in the corridor of an hospital is very difficult. So, this is good that we have a standard related to performance, related to safety. The second topic is shadow control. A surgical light, when you ask a nurse in an operating room, she would say that the surgical light is the most hated thing after the surgeon. <laughs> she, would, she would say, I don't like that because he, he is yelling at me because producing shadows. It's producing shadows. I hate shadows. I, it can disturb me in my day-to-day -day work. Shadows and the shadow control is something that is very subjective. How can you quantify this? How can you talk about this? Fortunately, there is a standard to talk about this. Fortunately, there is a standard to describe the way to measure the, shadow, the shadows. And, and for those who want to use the, the standard, they can use it to uh, describe their performance compared with the standard and sell this performance uh, to the end users. The, last, um, the, the, the next topic is, uh, it's not that often that it comes, but uh, obviously when a new uh, medical equipment comes um, in, in the, on the market, it's the time to make a new work item proposal. And I recall that was in uh, 1996, then uh, this uh, new uh, work item proposal what was brought up on, uh, on, uh, on the stage. Uh, for surgical lights, and so it, you know, it, it takes a very long time. Uh, for for it took a very long time, at least for this uh, product to be uh, standardized. But now we have we have a text, and it is very good. The um, uh, it, it's good to use a, a text in in terms of uh, innovation because uh, 
you can also interact with your customers. Whenever you know the text, whenever you know the performance that are very important um, for your customers, then you can interact with them. And you can talk about, well, our customers are surgeons, but we have very limited time to talk with them. They are biomedical engineers, nurses, and so on and so forth. So we can talk with them and, um, uh, and, and, learn, uh, and learn from this. So it's, it's a source of inspiration, it's a source of innovation. The, uh, there is, of course, a risk of non-participation to the standard because uh, uh, suppose that uh, uh, the so-called color temperature, which uh, helps you here at the moment to see my, uh, my skin here in, in good conditions, the, the, the color temperature that helps the surgeon to see the wound in good condition, uh, if this so-called color temperature would not be good enough for him to perform uh, the surgery in good condition, then that would uh, be detrimental to the quality of the operation. So uh, suppose that uh, the value of this color temperature, which goes between uh, red to blue in terms of contents, in terms of spectral contents, suppose that this is changing, and suppose that nobody from my company is attending the standard at the time, then it may be uh, very bad for us because we come with this light and then it's out of the standard, it's out of the specification because we were not attending the standard and we did not understand that it was uh, very important to have a, a color temperature that makes the, uh, the, the color of a, tissue, of a given tissue uh, faithful. And uh, the, this is related to product uh, development. As far as um, uh, these uh, changes and these regulatory changes are concerned. Um, we, um, we can also use uh, and uh, uh, use these, these uh, standards to try to have an eye, uh, an eye on the other standards around us. There is a standard for surgical light, there is a standard for uh, battery backup, there is a standard for different areas around uh, this uh, object. And uh, the good thing is that we have to uh, look at all uh, standards, not all of them, of course, but the related uh, standards, to avoid the conflicting uh, clauses. And it is very often uh, the case. So we, 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 we with a group, uh, try to avoid these uh, conflicts. And when there is a good will in, in a committee, when the, the committee uh, has a good understanding with one another, then it's perfect, you can work in good conditions. A topic that you may have heard about is photobiology. Uh, photobiology, you, may, you, you know that LEDs now are everywhere. In the past, we had this product made out of uh, halogen and then discharge bulbs, and there were uh, incandescent bulbs. I mean, there were different technologies. Now it's LED all over the place. It's LED all the time and only LED, 100% LED. LEDs are very good, they are very small, they can fit in a small volume, they are good in terms of uh, uh, no UV, no infrared, but they have uh, the problem of the blue light hazard if you don't pay attention. This, this quality of the light that has a, uh, as a sort of a, a blue content that may be detrimental for, for, for the eye. So uh, we as a um, company, we as a group, uh, have to pay attention that delivering 100 160,000 lux on, on the surgeon's uh, uh, body uh, takes this photobiological safety into account. And the experts in the group do not have this uh, compulsorily, uh, the a very precise knowledge in, the, in this area. So it makes, us, it makes it necessary to look for the experts outside of the group, and it, it's enriching our, our knowledge, it's enriching our group, the work of our group, and for this, uh, I would say that it's also prohibiting poor quality products, uh, because uh, I may be a patient, under this uh, surgical light, so I'm very conscious that I'm very conscious that this light uh, uh, does not have any uh, blue light uh, hazard in, into it. It can also help to uh, avoid. Um, uh, language <laughs> problems, because you know when uh, these uh, standards are translated into many languages, and uh, sometimes there are uh, strange uh, translations. Uh, 
And uh, in the course of, uh, of, um, of a standard, in the life of a standard, there may be changes to accommodate and to prepare better translations so that they really are uh, understood by the test houses or by the customers, by the biomedical, because a mere translation of an English text into French can be funny sometimes. And, um, and uh, then uh, this is basically it. As far as um, uh, uh, social responsibility, I, I, I do believe that uh, when you want to play a role in, in your area, when you want to play a role in surgical lights, you have to participate. It, it's your responsibility to help uh, the group to participate, to come as often as possible to these uh, working groups and to uh, bring your knowledge, sometimes invite experts and you can invite surgeons, you can invite uh, uh, scientists and they would come and they would help you to understand the topic. It would be very good for the sake of, uh, uh, of the uh, evolution of, of the standard. So the um, uh, this is, of course, time-consuming. It requires uh, preparation. It, it needs some time to prepare uh, the committees, but it is good for a company to prepare this because it helps to understand some uh, phenomenons like, uh, that are not compulsorily understood uh, uh, as a basis in, in a group like the photobiological safety I was mentioning before. And uh, sometimes it uh, gives you the ID that uh, helps you to bring an innovation on, on, uh, in your product. Like, this product, uh, as I told you, is supposed to reduce shadow. It, it, it's reducing shadows, but sometimes it cannot reduce shadow if you have, uh, for cardiac surgery, if you have one, two, three, four surgeons leaning over the table and it's compuls it, it is uh, producing shadows. So uh, we, we were attending these, convent these uh, committees and thinking, uh, scratching our heads and trying to find, well, there should be a way to avoid shadows. And uh, talking about shadows, talking about shadows, we, 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 we had the idea of having a sensor in the light head that would detect the head of the surgeon and would switch off some of the LEDs that they would not enlight the head of the surgeon and would maybe compensate by another part of the product the, so that the shadows are reduced. So uh, attending these uh, standards may also bring new ideas that you did not have before just for the sake of, uh, uh, just because you attended the, 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 the committee. And of course, it, uh, it helps to have a, 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 a sort of a, a surveillance on what is important for uh, the rest of the, company, of the companies. Then uh, the last uh, part is the uh, partnerships. During these committees, you invite experts, you invite surgeons, you invite your customers, you, you, well, you invite people who are um, linked with the topic and uh, in some way. And uh, it helps you to uh, create uh, this uh, relationship with customers, with uh, scientific committees, ophthalmologists in our case. It helps to create this uh, link that is really necessary uh, to uh, um, uh, create this flow of ideas and uh, for the sake of, of the quality of the products and for the sake of innovation. So, uh, I have tried to sum up in four, sli in four slides the main uh, um, advantages of attending uh, the uh, uh, standardization committee and, and the link with uh, innovation. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. Very interesting. And uh, I'm looking around if we have a question for you. Fr yes, right here. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. So I'm Jens Galko here from DKE. Um, so it was very impressive to see uh, how uh, standardization can uh, support innovation. But do you have a recommendation for, for us as um, uh, employees of a standardization organization, how we can even improve uh, to see what, what can we do better in the future? 
I mean, it seems that uh, also we heard in, in the talk before that uh, we have some some fundamental equations we learned uh, at our university time, but nowadays I have to, we have to learn that we have to rethink about them, and, and uh, this is maybe also a question we have to rethink about the structures. Uh. Well, uh, yes. Well, first of all, this sort of event is is contributing to this uh, prom the promotion of of, of uh, what you are mentioning. Um, uh, I would say that as uh, long as you can encourage uh, in any way, uh, I don't know which way, by uh, 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 connecting people with one another, uh, the um, participation of experts you would have in other fields, like uh, suppose I need an expert on uh, uh, photobiological safety and by some uh, coincidence or because you are in this area, you know an expert, then you may Ah, yes, you may bring these uh, experts into our group and make it uh, possible to uh, proceed further with, uh, with the standard. I think you, with the connection you have, I, I, I guess it's, it's possible to create uh, uh, this help uh, that you are mentioning, yes. Okay. There's another one up there. Good morning, Alberto from BSI in, in London. Uh, so a quick question, how do you deal uh, or how do you strike the balance between intellectual property and standards? To what extent uh, do you uh, rely on public knowledge and to what extent do you use trade secrets to balance your, your portfolio of innovation? Well, yes, you have, of course you have to be very careful. When you attend these meetings, you don't, you don't talk about the uh, the patented uh, IDs or about to be patented IDs, of course, like the uh, the sensor I was mentioning, uh, even though they were already in in uh, in a file um, uh, while we were attending, we did not mention that, of course. But uh, the uh, I think the patents are uh, very expensive. It's very expensive to apply for a patent, and not only to apply for a patent, but to maintain it over 10 years or so. So I would say that uh, sometimes I think uh, to myself that it may be more uh, effective to um, um, attend the standardization meetings than uh, applying for a patent, which is very, very uh, narrow. A patent is very narrow, and, uh, and uh, uh, the specification that you can develop and defend in a, in a standardization in a standardization committee may be wider, I would say, and may be more uh, profitable if you if you follow it uh, properly. So the economic benefit is greater there. That's what uh, I would say so because the patent is okay. very expensive, basically. <laughs> I want to ask you one last question to lead over to our next speaker also. And it is often said that standardization hinders innovation because of all the specifications uh, made. What would be your opinion on that? I would say that um, it depends on the working group. If a working group has a good... Uh, will, if they wish uh, uh, altogether to proceed further, then they can uh, uh, open uh, the specification when it is necessary okay. to open the specification. It may be the case, like for this surgical light, uh, we had uh, one meter in the past between the, the, light, the light and, and the table. But now we are thinking, well, the, the people are getting taller. Uh, and, and, and now we, we, we would need to bring the light uh, higher. Why would we, would we be so strict in the one meter? No, uh, we have to work together and okay. accept that it is more than one meter. So it's a matter of tolerance, uh, goodwill, and so on. Mm -hmm. So there is a yes uh, and there is a no, but I think that if uh, these uh, scientists you are talking about um, have a goodwill when attending a, a committee, then they, they, they would accept uh, such uh, uh, evolutions. Okay. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre Bress. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's, me, let's now move to our third and last presentation of this session. And uh, yeah, we are going to talk about this here. So actually, I'm wondering what this is. And let me introduce to so that uh, Florian Bachheibel. He is uh, from Munich, Germany, and managing director and co-founder of Valabo. 
which is a startup company developing an extra low voltage drive for electric vehicles. You have to explain me and I'm sure to uh, all our participants also. And uh, yeah, you will see, we will see your innovative product and uh, why standardization is important for innovative technology. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Great. Florian, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you Florian for your introduction. Good morning, everybody, and thank you to the organizing committee for inviting us here to present our new technology. So I'm uh, going to talk about low-voltage uh, electric vehicle traction. And uh, this means a voltage level below 60 volts DC, which is safe to touch and where there is no um, protection against touch required. Um, normally, one would say that this means that you have only very little power available, and I'm going to show you that this is not really necessarily true. So, um, we call our uh, drive system intelligent stator cage drive, and uh, during the course of my presentation, I'm going to explain to you why we think that it is an intelligent drive. The main drivers for uh, electric or electrification in vehicles are, of course, uh, that uh, first of all, we have a very large problems in, in large cities uh, concerning smog, not only in China, but also in the US and uh, in Germany. And uh, this just has to stop. So many countries are now thinking about banning internal combustion engine powered vehicles very soon. So there is a discussion going on about banning them in 2030 in, uh, in uh, the Netherlands and in 2035 in India. And this means that we need to uh, have a very fast transition towards fully electric uh, yeah, powered cars. There is, uh, of course, always the problem that we need the technology for that. And uh, Samsung is showing us in the moment that batteries um, do not necessarily have to be safe, but there has been uh, very much progress made in that direction. And batteries are now both safe enough and also have enough energy density to uh, fuel that uh, transition. Now, here you see a crash between a Tesla and an uh, internal combustion engine vehicle. And in this case, it's just a very, uh, yeah, uh, to, to demonstrate that, that uh, electric cars have become much safer. And uh, if compared to the overall population in electric vehicles, there are less fires in electric vehicles than in uh, combustion engine powered vehicles. And uh, although the press uh, does not cover that uh, accordingly, um, electric vehicles have become safe. But the main driver for the change is, uh, is also customer acceptance and uh, people who have already been in an electric car know that customer acceptance is very high. Over 90% of uh, all electric vehicle uh, drivers want to drive uh, or continue driving electric vehicles. And here you see the faces of people sitting in a, a Tesla Model S in insane mode, which means an acceleration of uh, 3.2 seconds from 0 to 100 kilometers. So let's look under the hood. What is there uh, in terms of uh, yeah, drivetrain? So the main um, drivetrain is uh, Con uh, yeah, uh, consists of uh, an electric machine with, with, um, with wound copper coils. So there is uh, a thin thread of copper which is wound around uh, an iron core in order to produce a magnetic field. And uh, the kind of winding determines the electromagnetic field that is in the motor for its lifetime. It cannot be changed anymore. In the end, all of these small threads are combined to uh, three threads that lead out of the motor and that are connected to a power electronic system. The disadvantages of wound copper coils are um, yeah, that, first of all, it's very hard to manufacture. It, yeah, the, the winding process destroys the insulation of the copper and therefore it uh, takes uh, manufacturers up to a year to get their uh, manufacturing equipment uh, set up in a way that they can have a very good uh, production quality. On the technical side, um, the filling factor, or the, the amount of copper that we get inside uh, the core of the machine is very small. It barely reaches 50%. And this means at one point that we have a very high uh, electrical resistance and therefore we create ma many losses inside the machine. On the other hand, it means that uh, the losses cannot be, cannot be cooled out of the machine very effectively because there is much air inside the machine and air is a very bad uh, thermal conductor. So it would make sense to have something uh, yeah, revolutionary and uh, to remove the copper coils and insert aluminium bars inside the stator core. And this is what you see here in this motor. 
So um, there is a, an uh, electro or a, a magnetic core which is identical to the core that we have in uh, in conventional electri electric dives, but instead of uh, the small copper threads, we have large aluminium bars, which are connected at one end of the machine, and on the other hand, uh, they are open to be connected to a power electronics circuit. Here in this case, you see uh, many cables uh, reaching out of the machine, and this is obviously a, a prototype design. In the um, yeah, later designs, we want to integrate the power electronics so that it is here in the uh, axial direction of the machine and very highly integrated. And um, yeah, this has, first of all, the advantages that we can have a very high filling factor. We can use the amount of air that is inside the, uh, the iron very efficiently. And we have a very good cooling because there is only uh, we have little air inside the uh, inside the core. We have another uh, option of cooling, which you see here. So we have uh, two cooling circuits. One is the the conventional cooling circuit through the jacket, and the other one is cooling the ring directly. So we have uh, yeah we can directly fill a, a cooling liquid through the ring, and therefore we cool the winding directly from. Where, or we, we remove the losses there where they, where they are created. On the power electronic side, I already told you that we need to uh, integrate them very closely to the machine, but we also change the, uh, the, the kind of power electronics that is used. Obviously, there is a very lo a low winding number, which means that we have a very low induced voltage. And uh, moving from a very high induced voltage like in, in uh, conventional machines, they, they have voltages of 150 to 200 volts. Um, you have to use IGBT uh, electronics. And these have uh, large disadvantages in terms of uh, uh, partial load efficiency. And we uh, remove them and, uh, and turn towards MOSFETs, which are much more efficient um, and which uh, can also switch faster, which is um, also good for uh, EMI characteristics. So um, the end would, or the, the end design that we want to reach is a, a very close integration of uh, small power electronics bridges, which are directly connected to the motor. Now, moving from high voltages such as 400 volts DC to low voltages such as 48 volts DC, normally means that we have to increase currents, and it, it does obviously. Um, but already in, uh, in existing drivetrains, you, re you reach uh, currents of, of above one kiloampere. The problem is now that due to the high voltage, the cables cannot be created in a coaxial manner. And that means that they create very high uh, electric uh, or magnetic fields. And sometimes uh, sensors are disturbed by those, uh, by those yeah, drivetrains. And in our case, we can remove those two wire uh, DC power nets and uh, create a coaxial power net which does not emit any uh, field at all. And we don't need very much uh, conductor for that. In our case, uh, if, we, yeah, if we go uh, for a large, very large power, uh, such as uh, 600 horsepower, then this means 10 kiloamps on a 48 volt power level. And to transmit 10 kiloamps from the battery towards the motor, takes us 10 kilo of aluminium, and that is not really much. And if you bear in mind that we have a very high power rating here, this means that it is definitely feasible. And uh, it is yeah, the, the common uh, conception that you need high currents, uh, high voltages, excuse me, for high efficiencies is not true in systems where you are very closely integrated, such as an electric vehicle. On the battery side, it's just a matter of reconfiguration. So the battery cells individually see the exact same current as they did in a high voltage system. They are just reconfigured from series connection to parallel connection. So, ah, the wrong direction, sorry. <laughs> and we've um, done some research uh, into the battery um, development and uh, we also found out that it's um, beneficial to the battery. Uh, because the the um, spread that is uh, created during manufacturing is leveled out through parallelization. Additionally, we can increase the amount of safety inside the battery because you can uh, insert cell interrupt devices, which uh, are activated through pressurization of the cell. And this is not possible for high voltage uh, systems. It's only really feasible for systems up to 60 volts. So now to come to the uh, even bigger advantages, 
you see that we have a very uh, large amount of, of control over the motor. And this means that we can change the uh, operating characteristics in operation. As I said, the wound machine is designed once and cannot be changed anymore. But we can now change the uh, uh, shape of the air gap field inside the motor, which means that we have some kind of an electric transmission. We can have a, a very a powerful motor for uh, slow driving and, and uh, high uh, torque demand. So we use a high number of pole pairs. And for uh, very fast driving and uh, very low torque demand, we use a low number of pole pairs. So the amount of divisions through which we divide the magnetic field can be changed. And this gives us uh, advantages in partial load efficiency. And um, yeah, that, that can be very important because uh, electric vehicles are uh, mainly operated in partial load. Another uh, factor for partial load efficiency is the, the transition from IGBTs towards MOSFETs. Because as you see, the IGBT has a diode-like um, behavior in, uh, in conduction phase. So the voltage drop across the device is basically independent of the current. And if we change to MOSFETs, they have a resistance-like behavior and the voltage drop across the device is dependent on the current. And that means that if both inverters are designed to have same losses at full load, then the MOSFET-based inverter will be more efficient in every partial load point. So uh, we have uh, run some simulations on drive cycles. And uh, there we are on the NEDC and the WLTC drive cycle. And you see the, um, yeah, the, the probability distribution of those drive cycle points in the operating range of the machine. And those are the small stars at the bottom. And this means that the points of very high torque demand and very high power are rarely used in the machine. And that is the points where electric machines are typically very efficient. And those 97% that you often hear are only reached in the corner points. And uh, we can increase the efficiency also in the uh, small load, uh, load points. And um, if compared to um, a Tesla uh, design, we can reach an increase in, uh, in drive cycle efficiency of 20%. And that's really important. So if we use the, those 20% and uh, also use them to reduce the losses in power net and battery, because they are also uh, creating losses, then this means another 5% of gain. Now we could reduce the battery size by 25%, which means less mass in the car, less mass to accelerate. And then uh, in order to reach the same uh, driving distance, we can reduce the battery size of by 30%. And this can also, uh, yeah, we, we don't have to reduce the battery. We can also keep it uh, the same size and increase the range by 25%. Now, as I said, the system is operating on voltages below 60 volts, and this has also advantages in safety. So there are no scenarios in which uh, high voltage can be, um, yeah, lie open, and, and uh, the uh, driver can be subjected to high voltages. Also, in, in manufacturing and in uh, in repair, in uh, maintenance, um, we have less training effort for the uh, personnel in uh, in the workshops, and. Uh, Another aspect is, is car mo modification by customers. Here you see a, a tuning car, which is maybe not in the focus, <laughs> but uh, there is, if, if you think about how uh, the transition from um, ICE-driven uh, um, yeah, motorcycles to electric motorcycles has happened in Asia, or in, in China uh, especially, they have just removed the ICE engine and inserted an electric engine. And this will probably also happen to, elect, uh, to cars, because the, the car is perfectly fine if you remove the uh, combustion engine and insert an ele electric engine. Um, also, if you manufacture an electric car, it, it makes sense in some countries to, uh, to work on a, at a voltage level that is, is intrinsically safe. And to just uh, give you another impression, this is this machine, our first demonstrator, and uh, operating at 48 volts. And uh, you can safely touch it, and you don't feel anything. It's uh, yeah, completely safe. So in terms of uh, operating uh, possibilities, there is, of course, um, electric vehicles uh, with a very large number of, uh, of units built every year. Then electric ships. Uh, also here, we have a very large advantage by low voltages, because in a salty atmosphere, it's very hard to uh, ensure uh, high voltage insulation over a lifetime of a system. In electric aircraft, we also have a, an advantage of, uh, of the 
voltage safety, but also um, we can operate with the lots, lots of defects. So we, we have, uh, if 10% uh, uh, of, of our electronics fail, then we still have 90% of our torque um, to continue operation. So it's a very graceful degradation mechanism. And there is, of course, trucks and buses. So now to uh, consider the standards. Um, yeah, maybe uh, we can just discuss that topic together. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, Florian. Very interesting and great you showed also where it's being used, your product. So I like that a lot. Thank, Thank you, you very much. So um, shall we continue just with the, uh, with the audience and ask if anybody has questions to you? Um, I would first like to ask you one thing that, uh, well, I already asked our uh, speaker before, Jean-Pierre. Um, have you ever had, in your experience, a feeling that uh, standardization hinders your product innovation? Not really, um, because... <laughs> <laughs> Great, <laughs> uh, I'm so glad. <laughs> <laughs> um, as I said, we, uh, to our experience, we, we are out of the standards, actually. So the, the ECE uh, R100 uh, is only valid for voltages above 60 volts DC. Um, so we're not... Uh, considered in that in that um, uh, norm, and uh, th one thing is is a bit problematic, and that is the the VDA three hundred and twenty, uh, which is uh, uh, for forty eight volt systems, and this requires an insulation test at uh, six hundred volts DC, and uh, we can we can have an insulation that is uh, fail safe up to six hundred volts, but it it reduces our um, our cooling efficiency. Okay. So it would for us it would make sense to have a, a, a lower efficient uh, a lower uh, insulation um, uh, quality, and um, as it stands now we, we will have to um, develop for uh, 600 volts. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are quality. standards that would increase the confidence in your products. Um, yeah, there are, but there it would also be interesting for us to have an, another standard which. Um, which uh, deals with um, electric vehicle traction at, at voltages lower than 60 volts, because that's non-existent up mm -hmm. to now. So existing uh, standards, could they be adjusted? Is, is that what you're thinking about? It, they could be, but um, the, for example, the, the ECE R100 requires a very um, high amount of, of safety precautions. And those, if, if we had to adopt them in our system, this would um, diminish our advantages. Okay. So we would like to have, uh, or we would need a standard which um, also uh, respects the, the advantages of low voltages. Okay. Oh. Thank you. I'm just looking one more time if uh, we have... Yes. <laughs> Jens Geico. So thank you. Very fascinating approach. Maybe one comment is uh, at the IEC we have a chronological numbering of the technical committees and the, the committee for the rotating electrical machine is number two. So you can imagine it's very old. <laughs> will, will be interesting <laughs> to see how, how these guys uh, react to, to your innovation. Uh, uh, maybe my question is more to Martin Poppe. It, uh, obviously it works, but with Maxwell. Uh, so with, with the workaround <laughs> we used for more than 100 years. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, do you see a potential to say, may, maybe if you improve more, you, you, we need the approach you proposed? Uh, I think, uh, uh, the uh, microphone here. Come up, back here, you can. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, uh, yeah. it should work. Just it, should work yeah. it should work? Yes, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, I'm fine with what, <laughs> what you're doing. And, uh, <laughs> what I propose is rather on the front of... Uh, nanotechnology and this is not really nanotechnology I think not really <laughs> so <laughs> as far as I'm concerned you're fine <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> okay is, is it just a, but that's a really a question I had later on is it really the nanotechnology or is it if you also go for high speed if, if you say one application might be nanotechnology if you go very small yeah but if you go for a very high velocity is it maybe also an no, no, no. That's really. not a problem. No, it, it is a question of consistency yeah. Yeah, and at very small distances. But the main point is about consistency. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there has been enormous progress in fundamental science in the last century, and most of that has been ignored. And that should not no longer be the case. Yeah? And uh, 
What I would address first is more the cooperation with other fields of science, so they know what we are talking about and we know what they are talking about. Mm -hmm. I think you are fine anyway. So <laughs> <Good to laughs> Let's know. hope that the uh, people won't ignore this innovation here. <laughs> <laughs> So on, on Friday we have uh, UNECE here the, from the regulator side. So UNECE is not directly standardization, but it's regulator. Yeah. But on the Friday afternoon they are uh, here, so maybe we can establish the contact. Okay, that's a great outlook. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your interesting presentations and ladies and gentlemen for your discussion. And uh, well, time for conclusions. And I think uh, we have seen... Uh, a wide range of things from very uh, fundamental science like the Maxwell equations to uh, yeah a new product uh, a new product launches and uh, yeah we've seen that standardization is indeed important for not only existing products but for uh, also innovations I think and uh, yeah talking about standardization organizations as developments uh, are faster than ever it's probably very important to modern new technologies and uh, future markets developments even more than ever. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending again. Um, as I always keep saying, we have a very tight schedule in this reinvention lab, so already in about 15 minutes at exactly 10.30, we'll continue with our next session and we'll be on the IEC master plan and young professionals. So I'll be very happy to see you back here in about 15 minutes and thanks for attending again. IEC General Meeting 2016 Connecting Communities Reinvent Standardization